And we're live and I'm gonna let people in now as well. Ron Schlecht. guys can start when ready. Okay, then I would like to call this <clears throat> for a moment of silence. And I know you're letting people in, but can you do the flags? We can do the Pledge of Allegiance. I can. Okay, if you're all joining me for the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United, United States, States, States of America, 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 America. And to the, to the republic, republic for which it, which it stands, stands. One nation, under God, God, liberty and justice for all. Liberty and justice for all. All right, Jerry, if I could have you do roll call for me. <clears throat> Jerry, okay. I got the list here. Do you want me to do it? I, I, I can see everybody, so I think I'll be good. But if I can't, then you can do it next. All right. All right. Arch Schneider. Here. Jill Warner. Here. Erica Connor. Here. <clears throat> and, um, Jeff Bokel. Here. Andy Mankey. Here. Joel. Here. I, did I forget anybody? Oh, Craig Wirtz. Here. Jerry Winchowski here. Mary DeMar here. Oh, Mary, sorry. <laughs> All right, so this is an open meeting and it has been noted as such. We will begin tonight with our citizens' comments. I believe Jeff Vocal, as well as Sean McNulty will read them for us. Okay, um, the first one we have is from Danielle Castro. She says, I'd like to know what precautions will be taken in the IPLC classrooms. These are very high touch classrooms with children frequently sharing spaces. They also have a much larger number of students. Thank you. Next email is from Jason Zehe. I apologize for pronunciation, it's Z-E-H-E. Good evening, I am just writing to say I applaud the MASD for keeping our schools open as an option. I feel that this is very important for the students and to many families, even if they don't take the time to express their gratitude. Thank you, Jason Zehe. The next email is from Kelly Jurek. I am all for in-person schooling. I think keeping the kids at home has detrimental effects on their mental health as well as their education. Please keep the schools open. Catherine Kelly Jurek. This is from David Trudelar. I am the father of Luke, Rachel, and Sarah Trudelar. I strongly want the students, uh, the schools to be open and stay open. Not one child in Wisconsin has died from COVID. My son Luke got his first F last semester and is acting depressed ever since school went virtual. The schools need to be open. Sincerely, David Tudelar. This is from Sean M. Laha. What metrics will be used to determine if there will be any changes to in-person school? Also, where will this information be available or located? Sincerely, Sean Laha. This one is from Jennifer Mosher. This is being kept short by your request. Please stay committed to providing a five day per week in-person classroom learning plan. Both of our children are still young and we do not have the option to stay at home with them. We moved here in March during COVID 
and they have not been able to meet any new friends. In-person classrooms are detrimental to their mental well-being. That may be an error in what she intended. Also, once the mask mandate is lifted, we do not want our children to be mandated to wear masks. Thank you, Jennifer and Stephen Mosher. This one is from Andy Northard. McQuanago Area School Board. My name is Andy Northard and I am in my fourth year teaching at Parkview where I am lucky enough to teach computer science, app creators, and our new Maker Lab course. I do not typically make this public knowledge, but I've had severe asthma for the last 25 years. I take daily medication and manage my lifestyle rigorously to keep it in check. With the guidance of my doctor, I have only had one asthma in incident in school since I started teaching 10 years ago. I am a hardworking, passionate teacher who loves my job and my asthma does not stop that. Trust me, when I get excited about what I'm teaching, you can hear me down the hallway. First, I would like to applaud you for making the decision on the mask mandate. I know you are experiencing some blowback, but I firmly believe that it is the best approach to allow for in-person teaching. While I wish we could return to the same setup we had before the pandemic, I am very concerned for my own health if the mask mandate was removed by the state government and or by the board, especially since it has an end date of September 28th. The most dangerous illnesses for me are those that affect breathing since my lung function is below normal. A typical day requires me to take more breaths than the average person. COVID-19 falls into that category. I am extremely worried that with human contact and no facial barriers that I would very quickly catch the disease. In that event, it would likely be that I would be hospitalized and put on a respirator. Please keep these health regulations in place and extend the date. Many of us in the school's li lives are quite literally on the line. COVID will not be gone by the end of September. We have seen only increase since we closed in March. If we want what is best for our students, family, and community, we need to keep masks for the foreseeable future. I want everything to return to normal like everyone else, but I ask you to remember that many of us teachers are at risk. I know that this idea is on the board's mind. It came up during the last school board meeting. Finding subs is already difficult enough. COVID will make it worse since many of the substitutes available are not in good health. However, I ask that you weigh the option, the lives of your employees and students or the inconvenience of a piece of cloth over the mouth and nose for everyone. In my mind, lives should always be a priority. Everyone will admit that COVID has caused trauma across the country like a secondary infection. Many claim that a return to school will reduce this. However, new studies show that COVID is not always just a one and done deal. Like chicken pox, it can have lasting effects. Because this virus is so new, we aren't sure what they are yet. Just because children don't get as sick doesn't mean they should be exposed. To those who say it causes breathing difficulties, meaning masks, as someone with reduced lung function, I have no more issues breathing through a mask than I normally do. <coughs> Find one that works and buy as many as you need. Practice by wearing it for several hours at a time to get used to it. Build good habits because it will keep everyone safe. Wearing a mask is an act of compassion. You never know who has underlying health issues. Wear one to protect yourself, but most importantly, wear one to protect your community. Here in MASD, we build better schools together, students, staff, and community. Protective equipment and masks are an essential step to helping us rebuild. He attached three articles to this. I'm not going to read them. In closing, I want to thank, for your, thank you for your dedication. I know these decisions are difficult and not everyone will be happy, but please do not bend to politicize pressure that endorses risky behavior. I truly do appreciate the time and thought the board has put into helping us weather the situation. Sincerely, Andy Northard, PVMS Computer Science, STEM. Is that all you had, Jeff? No. Nope. Next one is <clears throat> from the Hortons. Dear board members, we have two children enrolled at the high school. Those children have grandparents who are healthy, comprom health compromised and at greater risk for deadly complications from the virus affecting our community and our country. I'm going to cut right to the chase. Too many families in this community are teaching their kids it's okay to ignore science, that masks and this virus are stupid. 
It's frightening. Our observations include students who are children of MHS staff. We see the posts, the ignorance, the flags, the lack of human kindness and consideration for others, and we're terrified. We feel we haven't been informed enough of the exact safety protocols that you will have in place for in-person learning in order to make an informed decision or of your plan for truly enforcing safety among all students. What about passing times in the hallways? What about lunch? What about the images on the news of students gathering at schools that have already opened in our country and the news that those schools have had to close already? Please don't let parent influence determine the truly safest path for our community, our teachers, and our kids. The novel virus comes with documented health complications far beyond just a death count. Our numbers are rising, not declining. If we go back to in-person learning, at least give parents an out window when it fails. When we see tears from our kids whose classmates refuse to care about them, when they fake cough on them on purpose, call them names and snowflakes, we had a bully issue before the pandemic. It's infinitely worse now under the current national leadership. My daughter just received a quote, see you in school, <coughs> sweetie, quote, message that she absolutely interpreted as a threat. Read the students' Instagram pages, the tweets. We're deeply concerned about returning to school this fall. My children crave in-person instruction, the structured days, but we need more information. We need to really understand how seriously the district is taking this unprecedented wave of conflict, health concerns, and uncertainty. Thank you, the Hortons. Next one is from Heather Borgen. Dear school board and administration, I want to thank you for your hard work during the last few months. You have had an impossible task set before you, and I appreciate all the thought and effort you have put forward to get us back to school. I am writing this email from my classroom. It looks different this year, but that's okay. It's just a room. What will make this room special will be the 20 plus students I will be welcoming on September 1st. Thanks to you. Every student that enters my room will be loved and challenged this year, even though they have to be distanced and wear a mask. We'll be together and that's what matters. I encourage everyone to be positive for their child's sake in the upcoming days, weeks, and months. We as parents, educators, and community members set the tone. Let's make sure we are setting a loving, kind, and positive tone for our kids. I want to thank the parents and community members who have taken the time to encourage teachers over the last few weeks. You are heard, and we appreciate you. Again, thank you, school board and administration, for your hard work getting us back in our classroom so we can do what we love. Heather Borgen, first grade teacher, Big Bend Elementary School. This is from Dan Flaherty. <laughs> McGuanago School Board, as the parent of a current student and a grandparent of another, I support the school board's decision to have five day per week in person school in the classroom setting. We have already lost a spring session for our students and it's reminiscent of the separate but equal shameful days of our county as those states with the sense to have remained to have remained open are providing a superior education. It was clear that remote learning did not work as a district and while I'm all for saving tax dollars, it is necessary for our schools to be open. Thank you, Dan Flaherty. This is from Katie Paulson. My name is Katie Paulson. I have a fifth and a third grader. My husband and I are very thankful you are moving forward with the five day in-person plan with the virtual option. Thank you for keeping our children's education the top priority and allowing families to choose what means of providing this education is best for their own family. The next one is from Crystal Fry. Hello, board members. With the continued surge of COVID-19 cases, both in our county and state, do you continue to feel like a traditional five-day-a-week op five option is safe? If so, which mitigation measures do you feel will be more successful and sustainable than other schools currently changing course? Thank you, Crystal Fry. Next one is from Erica Keys. What is the policy for school attendance when a student or teacher has COVID-19 symptoms, but does not take a COVID-19 test? Sincerely, Erica Winkler, mother of two MASD students. Next one is from Becky Miller. 
Dear MASD School Board, I am aware that while the school, high school reopening plan has not yet been released, I have not heard anything about specific measures that would be critical for our safety of our students and staff. What is being done to minimize the amount of students that are passing in the hallways between classes? What is being done to decrease the amount of students in the cafeteria during the lunch periods? I've seen specific measures outlined at both elementary and middle schools. With a high population of students at the high school level, I'm sure these issues have been well thought out. I'll remain hopeful that this will be included in the high school's reopening plan. Sincerely, Rebecca Miller. That's all I have. John, did you have a couple also? I do have three. So the first is from Nick Jake. Good afternoon. I was just curious if there has been a plan discussed as to what needs to happen if the school goes into lockdown state while there are classes being conducted outside <clears throat> tents. Will there be additional staff keeping an eye on things in the surrounding areas? Thank you, Nick Jake. Next one, dear MASD school board, as parents of two children with the, within the McGuanago Area School District, we are excited for a new school year to begin. However, very concerned about the future of our children's experiences based on the mitigation measures that, that have been put in place within each school. We understand at this point, everyone's hands are tied for now due to the Wisconsin State ruling regarding masks. However, we overwhelmingly urge you to reconsider the original vote by the board to require these masks within our district indefinitely. We also highly encourage you to reconsider the many other mitigation measures that have been put in place. For example, plexiglass barriers, social distancing within lunch periods, recess, etc. As the total number of cases positive deaths is virtually non-existent within children, parents and staff should have the ability to make choices for their own families and themselves. The district is making decisions based on numbers and without parental input, not okay. Every number and statistic needs to be taken into consideration, not just the number of cases, which includes hospitalizations, total tests, positives, negatives, deaths, etc. These mitigation measures have done and will, these mitigation measures have done and will do even more uh, damage socially, emotionally, and psychologically the longer this continues. Thank you for taking the time to read this. Sincerely, Steve Rogley. And the last one uh, from Kevin Helm. Good evening. The last two meetings focused a lot on the number of cases when dealing with how the school is going to look when reopening. I think the bigger focus needs to be on hospitalization numbers, which have remained constant re recently on average. Another data point to look at is the age group of infection. Uh, 10 children ages 19 and under have been in intensive care since March dealing with coronavirus related issues. Zero deaths so far in the state within that age group. I think we are making too big a deal of just the positive case count instead of looking at the data that actually matters, especially in school aged children. The source is from the Wisconsin DHS on, that, on this data. Please don't shut down the schools just because positive cases count spiked in or around the area. Thank you for your time, Kevin Helm. And that's it. Okay. Thank you everyone for your comments. We are gonna move ahead to consent agenda. I am looking for the approval of board minutes from July 27th, 2020 and August 10th of 2020, as well as the approval of voucher numbers 129717 to 129943 in the amount of 1.1 million and change and receipts for July of 2020 totaling $495,000. Do I have any questions or concerns? Hearing none, they are approved by consent and we will move right into the Student Learning Committee update by Cherry. Yes, um, we met on August 3rd and we <coughs> had a citizen's comment regarding math credits for from Parkview. As when you go into the high school, you would get a, a high school math credit versus a just a credit for that's not a math credit, it's just an elective credit. So we are gonna discuss that and bring it back to the September meeting and we will bring you more information on that. We had an update on the virtual schools, on the hybrid learning, and Sean gave us an update on the reopening plan. That was our meeting. Stephanie, did you wanna add anything to that or is that good? No, I think that covers it. 
Okay, then Sean, the reopening updates presentation. Yeah, so Ben is gonna put the Google slide presentation up on the screen so everybody can see it. All from I think he's going to do that. I'm working on it. Here we go. <clears throat> so board members, we, we do have all of our directors here tonight. And so as we go through this presentation, if you want to ask questions of Christine Bowden, Stephanie Blue, Susan Minter, Tom Karthauser, uh, feel free. Andy Wegner is also here. We have a couple of principals on board with us tonight. So feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, any financial, financial related questions, uh, cost of things, uh, you can ask during this presentation, but uh, know that Tom does have a budget update after this presentation is over. So uh, first and foremost, not only for the board, but also for any staff members, any parents, any community members that are listening to us tonight, the McGuanago Area School District does remain committed to providing face-to-face -face and virtual options. And we are committed to reopening our schools next week, Tuesday. So we have one week, September 1st, believe it or not, is one week away. So please know that we have not changed our minds uh, since we announced this. At the end of June, we have remained committed to these two options. We've done a lot of work and a lot of planning uh, the last several weeks. Uh, the board members should be aware that we have completed our virtual enrollment. So that's for K through 12. We don't have virtual option for 4K students. And Ben can go to the next screen here and you can see what our enrollment numbers look like. So at this time, we have 637 students enrolled K-12 in our virtual option. So we have just over 5,000 students in the district. So that's about 12.7, almost 13% of our students have chosen this option. And then you can see the breakdown K through six, we have 333 students, seven, eight, 108. And then at the high school, we have 196 students in our virtual model. So again, 637 total. Can go to the next slide, Ben. This is just off the bottom of the large sheet board members that we gave you. So this sheet looks like this. If you take a look at the very bottom, we do have our virtual numbers updated. And so again, you can see 333 students in elementary and then you can see that we have at kindergarten 41, first grade 57, 39 at second, 49 third, and so on, 48, 45. And then I guess the sixth grade got cut off there. We have 54 in sixth grade. And then you can see the teachers. We have two sections, two sections at each grade level, K through 12. I'm sorry, K through six. The next slide is going to show you the impact that that virtual enrollment had upon our enrollment, upon our class size at the elementary level, and also staffing. So there's a lot going on in this slide. And again, this is coming off, off this document that we shared with you on Friday. So I'm going to try to explain this to you, and we're going to start on the far left. So this is just one piece of that enrollment document that we gave you. And you can see that this is a snapshot from last week. So it has changed since then, but we're gonna take a look at it uh, from what it looked like last Friday morning at, at 8 a.m. So in the far left-hand side, you can see that we're looking at Big Bend Elementary. Before we started the virtual enrollment, Big Bend was projected to have 441 students. They had 56 students sign up. They had 56, Ben, you can go back. They had 56 students sign up for virtual. And so in the blue box on the far left-hand side, they ended up with 385 students. 
for in-face, face-to-face learning. So again, this is face-to-face -face for Big Ben. We looked at the virtual, this is face-to-face. -face. So 385 kids now at Big Ben. Then you can see kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, the teachers. Kindergarten is in orange because that is a place where we reduced a teacher. So when you look at the big sheet of paper across all six of our elementaries, where you see a grade level highlighted in orange, that's where we reduced by one teacher due to the number of students that went to virtual and then they fell below the threshold for the number of students that they needed for a third teacher or a fourth teacher. So we, we followed class size policy. And so you can see that at kindergarten, you need to have 50 students for three sections. They have 49, and you can see that on the bottom here, they have 25 in one class and 24 in the other. And again, it's highlighted in orange because we reduced by a section there. You can see in, if we move across to the right, first grade, they have three sections, 21 in each class for a total of 63. If you look down at the bottom, you can see the 63. Again, this is face to face. Grade two, they'll be at 19, 18, and 18 for a total of 55. Grade three, they'll be at 61. Grade four, 49, 47. And then again, uh, grade six, they have 62. So by taking those students out of the face-to-face -face classrooms, what has actually happened across the district in the vast majority of our classes, we have actually reduced class size. So across the district in the elementary, due to the virtual enrollment, at the vast majority of our grade level in our elementary schools, we have been able to reduce class size. And that is going to help with social distancing as we move forward throughout the school year. You can see that there are some vacancies at Big Bend. So first grade, third grade, and sixth grade. Two of those three were because teachers at that grade level moved to virtual. Another one, uh, the first grade opening was open. So those have been filled and Susan will give an update on staffing later in the meeting, but those have been filled. Any questions on this? And again, on the sheet of paper that we shared with you, you can take at Eagleville, Clarendon, Rolling Hills section in Prairie View and what we did in those buildings also due to the virtual enrollment. I have a question. Yep. I was wondering what the orange was when I was looking at the paper. So now that I know that makes total sense. So in the classrooms that you had to that you eliminated one and we are one student away from having another section. If yes. someone who is virtual after a quarter says, I would like to go into that classroom, are you going to add a third section? Question number one. Question number two, I know we're also struggling with our age situation. So on those classes, even though we have those large numbers, we usually would have an aid because three of the seven rooms where we had to to take a group out are 5K. And if any of our classrooms that would need a smaller classroom or an aid or something, it would be our 5K because I believe, maybe I'm wrong, but they would be one of the larger challenges keeping them with masks on and doing those kinds of things. So that's my question. Yeah, so uh, as far as kindergarten, we do have instructional assistance in each classroom for kindergarten and those instructional work, uh, assistants work 28 and a half hours a week. So we do believe that we have good support in the kindergarten classrooms, even for those higher numbers. As far as adding a section, if we have another student after the first trimester, for example, that wants to come back to kindergarten, we are going to have to take a look at that carefully because as Tom explained, and Ben, if you want to go back to the virtual enrollment, these are all new, new positions. These 14 positions are all new positions. We have added a number of new teachers to be able to staff the virtual model. 
and that does have an impact upon our budget. So if we go back, Ben, or to the next slide, not back, back, uh, if we go forward one slide, what we can't do is we can't add a teacher for Big Ben Kindergarten to make three unless we take one away from virtual. We're not going to be able to add any more teachers because of class size. And again, I would, I would ask you to withhold judgment until you get uh, Tom's budget update. However, that said, at the trimester, if things are going well, it's very possible that we will have a number of students that want to come back. And based upon the number of students that want to come back, we might be able to move a teacher, but I, I cannot promise that at this time. Does that answer your question, Sherry? It answers it. May not be the answer you wanted. I get that. I'm probably going to do that a lot tonight. Other questions? Okay, Ben, we can go to the next slide. And then as far as staffing and Stephanie is here, she can help answer any questions how the virtual model will look for our secondary students at Parkview Middle School and McGuanago High School, but you can see that for English, science, social studies, and math, we have a grade seven to nine teacher for each of those subjects, and then also a grade 10 to 12. And I know on the screen, the, the grade 10 to 12 teachers might have got cut off because of the video here, but we have do have teachers in grades 10 through 12 for English, science, and social studies we still have a vacancy in, in math. We are still looking for a teacher there. We have one teacher for grades seven through 12 for world language. And then the other electives are gonna be covered by staff with overloads. Any questions about staffing for the virtual at the elementary or the secondary? So Sean, just to, just to double check um, and reiterate, these teachers will be completely virtual teachers. They will not be in the classroom doing dual duty. That is correct, except for the secondary elective teachers. So okay. those teachers, and actually that's at the elementary too. So I guess I didn't mention how we're gonna cover <clears throat> for the elementary, art, music, and phi ed. Those will be covered by our face-to-face -face classroom art, music, and phi ed teachers. Same thing at the secondary level. We'll be paying those folks overloads to provide elective courses to, to these students. Stephanie, am I saying that correctly? Let's, let's get the experts in here. Um, you are with the exception of possibly 10-12 um, science. We are struggling to find a certified chemistry um, teacher to come in. Um, and so just this afternoon, we're looking at possibly restructuring that seven or 10, 12 um, science position. And it, it may need to include some teachers who are teaching both face to face and then agreeing to do an overload for us. Um, but we're working through that as of this afternoon. But everything else Sean said is, is accurate. And just to, so Kyle Barton is over on the far left hand side of the screen. He is the grade 10 to 12 English teacher. And then Ellie Werspicki is the grades 10 to 12 science teacher. Katie Kozlowski is 10 to 12. So it got a little formatting problem with the slide. That's all. I would add too that for special education, we had to um, have four elementary um, special education teachers um, into the virtual world. They're not add-ons, but they were um, teachers that were currently staffed in buildings and are now um, working the virtual aspect of special education. And then we have one um, person at the middle school who is um, doing virtual and some co-teaching. And then we have um, one, we have a blend at the high school. We hired one limited term um, person for the high school. We're still sort of in process of that. And then um, we have uh, two teachers up there doing a little bit of, of both virtual and um, in person.
But so as for virtual, what I'm hearing is we only need one, we only have one vacancy right now for 10, 12 signs. Yes. And everything else is full. Yes. Yeah. Um, we were trying to do the 10, 12 math hire today. I, I think that it went through. Um, but yes, I think we're, we're good except for uh, 10, 12 science right now. Okay. All right, Ben, we can go to the next slide. So as we move towards our September 1st start, I do understand that there are a lot of people a lot of staff, a lot of administrators, a lot of parents, a lot of families that are extremely happy that we're starting face to face. But I also understand that some people are wondering how long will we be able to maintain face to face instruction. So in my mind, there are several components that we need for one, a successful start and then two, for us to be able to sustain that successful start and stay open. So this slide shows the necessities for successful start and sustainability. So if we wanna have a great start, one, and some of these things are out of our control, some we have no control over, one, we have got to have a strong COVID-19 testing program. And to be honest, right now, there are some concerns in Waukesha County about the testing program. Waukesha County Health Department shared with us last week that believe it or not, there are still shortages of testing supplies. We also have to be able to isolate our positive cases. We have to have an effective contact tracing program. And those two things, Noelle Mengi, our district nurse, is here tonight to talk in particular about those two things. We have to have a reduced uh, spread of the virus. So it is very, very difficult. We've seen it across the country in communities that have wide community spread of COVID. It does not work to open schools face to face. We need to have our buildings, our schools fully staffed, and then we need to have mitigation measures. And I'm gonna talk about a number of these things, but we'll go to the next slide and I'm gonna introduce Noelle and her part of the program tonight. So we've been talking about symptoms and when uh, parents need to keep their children home. Uh, we've talked about quarantine procedures and contact tracing and close contacts. We've been talking about these things for the last several weeks. We did finally get some additional guidance from the Wisconsin Development Department of Health Services, or DHS. They released new guidance last week, Thursday. So we just got this not too long ago. The title of that guidance is called Guidelines for the Prevention, Investigation, and Control of COVID-19 Outbreaks in K-12 Schools. And Noel is gonna to try to provide some clarification for when parents should keep their children home based upon the symptoms that they have when they're sick and she's also going to clarify our procedures for isolation and quarantine. So we're going to move to the next slide and then Noel Mengi. Um, and please remember that Noel is the messenger. So this is from the State Department of Health in Waukesha County. Thank you, Sean. So in order to keep um, students and staff healthy, we need to make sure we're coming to school healthy. So these guidelines were released last week, Thursday, um, and this was reviewed also with Waukesha County as of today. Um, so everything that I did put on these next couple slides was reviewed as of today. And it's emphasized that as of today, because this is a very fluid situation. So guidelines do change very frequently, but this is as of today what the recommendations are now. So um, if we could go to the next slide. So we, we'd like to encourage everyone to look at this and really decide how you're feeling for the day, how your students are feeling for the day. These guidelines, um, again, were reviewed with Waukesha County as of today. So as of today, what they are recommending 
is if within the last 24 hours, you've experienced one of these following symptoms in the first box um, above your normal or baseline health. Um, so if you have a cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, or new loss of um, smell or taste, um, that is what they're considering the one symptom to stay home. Um, again, I want to emphasize symptoms above my baseline. So if you have a normal cough, if you have a cough you get when you have asthma, um, that is your baseline. That is normal for you. These are looking at abnormal things for you or your student. Um, in the next um, yellow box to the right, it is um, a two symptom category. So if you have two of these following symptoms, it is then recommended that you stay home. So that's the, the fever, the muscle aches, the headache, the sore throat, fatigue, um, muscle or body aches, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting, and diarrhea. So two of those, uh, we would be recommending that you do stay home. There are instances where you may have just one. So a fever, um, diarrhea, or vomiting alone. Um, at that time, we would just follow the normal school guidelines that were already in place, and that's to stay home for at least 24 hours. Um, as um, again, those are like the normal school guidelines that we had. So if we jump back down to that stay at home category on the left hand side, um, what we would have you do next, um, of course, if you're having trouble breathing, chest pain, confusion, unable to wake up, that's an emergency call, whether in school or at home. If you have just one of the, the symptoms in the one category or two in the two category, um, we do recommend seeking medical evaluation, either call your physician, um, see if they recommend testing. Um, at that time, we also do recommend you remain home for at least 10 days since the first symptom began and be fever free for the last 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medications and improvement of symptoms prior to returning. Um, at this point too, they also recommend siblings of the household should follow close contact um, guidelines. So as if this person were positive. So if it is a student with a brother or sister with um, an abnormal cough, shortness of breath, it is recommended to keep those siblings um, or others in the household home. Um, if after seeking medical guidance, um, and you do have a COVID test, and that COVID test comes back negative, um, we then follow our normal school guidelines of making sure you're fever free for 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medications. Um, and then if another diagnosis comes up at that time, um, such as strep throat um, or influenza, we then follow the normal guidelines for exclusion um, for that specific diagnosis. If you have a positive test when you go get checked, um, essentially we, ha we are having you isolate at your home for 10 days from the start of symptoms. Um, and improvement of symptoms and fever free for 24 hours prior to returning. So with that being said, can we go to the next slide? This is just kind of a reiteration of um, what to do if you have been diagnosed with COVID-19. So again, this is straight from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. Um, they say, um, stay home for at least 10 days since your symptoms began and be well for 24 hours or um, being well meaning free of fever and improvement of your other symptoms. Next slide. So um, when you are tested positive, you may be tested positive and you may not have had any symptoms. At that time, the isolation at home changes to 10 days since the sample was collected. So um, if you get tested, let's just say you were on quarantine because um, you were in close contact with somebody. You go get tested um, and it comes back positive, 
but you have no symptoms, you still have the 10 days from that day the sample was collected. At that time, um, other siblings, household members, and close contacts would be um, need, made quarantine at that time. So that would be 14 days from the date of last exposure before returning to school. Um, if the exposure to a household member um, cannot isolate away from others um, in the home, the last date of contact with that COVID positive person may be the day of um, the last day of isolation of the positive case. Um, and that's, oh, sorry, can we go to the next slide? So talking about a close contact, this is the definition of a close contact from Waukesha County, again, as of today. So close contact, we're looking at if you had direct physical contact with someone, um, if you were within six feet of that person for more than 15 minutes. Um, and by 15 minutes, that means like throughout the day. So if you um, um, had 10 minutes with the person and then later you saw the same person again, um, for another 10 minutes or five minutes, that would be a cumulative 15 minutes. Um, if you were directly sneezed on, coughed on, um, shared something um, like a glass of water or food or towels with that person that was positive, you would also be a close contact along with stay, staying overnight for at least one night at the household with that person. Um, going to um, the close contacts of um, a COVID positive person that you may live with. If you cannot completely isolate from that person, um, I mentioned a little earlier, um, but your quarantine will end, I'm sorry, your quarantine will start the day their quarantine ends. So if their day 10 um, was on the, the first of the month, you then have um, 14 more days to stay home to see if you develop any symptoms. If you can totally isolate and completely separate <coughs> from the sick person um, and have no time together, you don't spend any time in the same room, no sharing of spaces, um, then you would just have the, the straight 14 days from your last contact of that person. Noel? Yes. So does that mean that the um, close contact could be home for 24 days where the person who actually was tested positive would only be home for 10? That is correct. Thank you. Um, quarantine release times, if you could go to the next slide, Ben. Um, so to get out of a quarantine, um, there really is no way of getting out of a quarantine. So if you were in close co contact with someone who was positive, you automatically have 14 days from your, from your last contact with that person. A negative COVID-19 test does not get you out of the quarantine um, because essentially you have 14 days um, that on day 13, you may be positive. Um, so that's the time that they are recommending or requiring that you stay in quarantine. Um, if you develop symptoms while you are on quarantine, um, so if you had contact with someone and you're on quarantine and you start developing symptoms, um, then we start an isolation period of the day you started symptoms and that goes to, um, you have 10 days from the start of the first symptom where you need to stay isolated. So well, that did not require a positive test that was just based on a symptom? Um, do you mean a contact or? Yes. So you said a negative test doesn't get you out of it. Correct. But if you're in it and then you start a symptom, it starts counting that day 
with or without a test? Correct. Yeah, it starts with those symptoms. So then we would go back to that like flow sheet. What was the symptom? Was it a cough, shortness of breath? Was it the one symptom or the two symptoms? And you kind of follow that, follow that um, starting all over again. What if a sibling had it tested positive, quarantined, and then the sibling, another sibling started showing signs? The one who has already been quarantined with the COVID, presumably is over it, can they go back to school or do they then have to quarantine again even though they've already had COVID? That is a good question because that is questionable. So that is something I do have to follow up with Waukesha County on. Um, because I've heard it a couple different ways and I would rather hear from them before I give that answer. Yeah. Other questions about isolating, about quarantines. This, this gives you a good idea of the challenges that we face when there is widespread of the virus in the community. And that's why we've been looking at that data and that we're gonna take a look at some of that data right now. But um, widespread of the virus in the community uh, makes it tough. Any other questions for Noel right now? I don't, I don't know if this is the time to ask. So from our last meeting, you said we were going to be responsible for our tracking in the district. The county was not. They would, they would track positive cases. And then the other ones we had to do, is that co still correct? Correct. So we'll be in charge of, um, or I will be in charge of um, who was this positive student in contact with? Um, and who needs to quarantine based off of um, the contact they had with other students. Did that answer your question? Yes, so at this point okay. in time, that responsibility falls to you. Correct, from my understanding as well though, anything outside of school, so if someone got a positive <laughs> um, result and it was a, a weekend, um, or if it was a Monday and let's say two days prior, it was the weekend. Well, that student was not in school. So there may be school activities that we have to follow up on. Um, but if it's outside of school, no. So then Waukesha County is gonna carry it from there. Correct. So I know other districts are hiring people to help with that because they feel it's going to be overwhelming. Has that been discussed or is that coming up in a bit? That, that is coming up in a bit. So you'll see in when, when Susan talks about the staff hires, we are recommending that we hire another district nurse. That district nurse would be in charge of uh, the traditional district nurse duties. And Noel is going to be our COVID nurse. So congratulations, Noel. My pleasure. And, and unfortunately, we, we do have staff that are already in quarantine. And, and I can share more information in executive session. I can't share names and things like that, but I can give you a, a better idea of, of the challenges that we face with that. Sean or Noel, I think, and I'm sure I know the answer to this, but I'm gonna ask anyway. So do you, does anyone get any detail looking at this slide about cases in our district? Do, I, I'm sure you've asked that question. I know we've asked it before. It just, you know, as we work towards what happens if we had to shut down, I would think that has to be a valuable statistic. Yeah, so. Side of our own tracking. I'm, what are they gonna share with you, if anything? So, are you at, I'm sorry, are you asking? <laughs> Jill, if we know positive cases within yep. our school district, in yes, our district. we do. Right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
as a matter of fact, I can show you some information here in a few slides. Okay. Other questions about isolation, symptoms. We're gonna start sharing that with our parents this week. I know you just shared this presentation uh, with us. Is this posted on the, our website? Or in, a, in the doc place? So it, it is not, but it will be. It will be, okay. Yep. And is this the place that I would ask a question about if a child is quarantined, what their education would look like, or is that coming up later? No, now is a good time to ask that. Okay, so, okay, so we had, said that if a child is quarantined or is diagnosed with COVID and leaves a classroom that was a face-to-face -face classroom, that then they would have their instruction in particularly, maybe the COVID kids are really sick or maybe they're not, but the quarantine kids aren't really sick because they don't have it yet. So then their education would be still under the direction of their classroom teacher, not the virtual teacher. So does that mean that the classroom teacher will be doing some virtual teaching and some classroom teaching? What would it look for a student who was quarantined or was sent home? Yeah, so the, um, again, the face-to-face -face teachers will continue to educate their own students even if the student goes out on quarantine. And so that's why we felt it was important to bring in Seesaw and Google Classroom uh, for the 2020-2021 school year as a platform for teachers to keep up um, videos, instruction that they can provide the students, and then also handouts and things like that, that the students will be taught very quickly into this school year, um, starting day one to access that and know that they're going to go there to get their assignments if they are out ill for any reason during the school year. But will they have some face-to-face -face time or some interaction with the kids in their classroom, some virtual connection, or you go home and for 14 days, check your blackboard? I, that's what I'm asking. Okay, um, so we have ordered quite a few webcams for our classrooms um, and we'll be at the beginning of the year um, practicing using those in the classroom. Um, but uh, we're also going to be, I mean, we're gonna be recording um, lessons and the majority of it will come from that. We are not going to just automatically have students join a classroom live when they're gone. Do, do we, do you have any concerns? Like, let's just say there was a, a positive case in a third grade classroom. So if there's a positive case, the possibility of a close contact of it, a good amount of children would be, pro would be probable. So now we have Let's just go with eight, which isn't even a big number. So we have eight kids at home doing quarantine and their parents are having to go to work. We, I understand that's not the issue or whatever. So they're not really virtual and they're not really classroom. Do we have some, some concern over how that, that's gonna work? Educationally, they'll access the Google Classroom. Do we have concern for families that are bouncing in and out of that? Sure. Um, well, even, even educationally, what the children are going to be able to accomplish. I, Cause I was discussing like a third grade classroom or second grade classroom. That's not a classroom that can have independent study. Correct. So we will, we will do our best to upload the videos so parents can access them. That's again why we're not gonna go into a synchronous system um, for our kids that are on quarantine because we're very aware of the fact that many of those parents are going to be at work. Uh, that's why we wanna rely more heavily on videos so that when the parents come home from work, they may be able to help the student access those rather than say they have to be on with the kids during the day, there's going to be more complications that way. And so that's why we're gonna rely on the recorded videos more um, than anything live. So they could kind of do second shift school is what you're saying. Correct. 
Okay, so then the next question is, have we gotten guidance on what percentage of any given classroom is out before that whole classroom goes virtual? So that is, have we given anybody and given any information on that? I can, I can answer that. So the Washington County Health Department will not establish a threshold for a number of students that are absent uh, means that you must close down a classroom or a school. So what are you thinking if there's five kids in the classroom that teacher will teach five and the other 20 are home or what are you thinking? So we, we have, we, we don't have an answer for that at this time. I, I really think that we have to see how it goes. I'm reluctant to say, um, I'm reluctant to say if we have 50% of the students out of a classroom, um, we will shut that classroom down because I, I don't know how, how often that will happen. And again, it's not like they have norovirus or they have, have influenza or pertussis. Uh, many of these children might be home simply because they were close contact. So it doesn't mean that they're necessarily sick. Right, right. And so I'm, I'm reluctant to establish a threshold. I, I can tell you, we, ha I, we will have that conversation again with Waukesha County Superintendents and the Waukesha County Health Department on Wednesday morning at 10. Because this is what was talking about when we were talking about the Minnesota model and then Harvard model, right? This is the, this is the piece that, that those things address, right? Well, well the, the Minnesota model uh, established when you would, that would be uh, countywide, every school in the county would either, based upon the number of cases in the county, every school in the county would either be all virtual, all face-to-face, -face, hybrid, all hybrid, or some combination thereof. So that, well, just use that as, as an example last um, couple weeks ago, uh, that would be nice to be able to have all the schools in the county be uniform. There's certainly some, some drawbacks with that model though too. Uh, we're, we're not considering that model. We're, we're looking at the Harvard model, uh, modified Harvard model more at this moment. But uh, as one of the last slides will show you, we don't, we don't have our criteria established yet. Have you seen, have we seen that Harvard model, Sean? Have you sent that out to us? I have not. And I, you, didn't, I did not, I'll explain why I didn't include it on the presentation or on the, on the slideshow because I included the Minnesota model last month in my memo and also in the presentation talked about it. And then I had a bunch of people look up the Minnesota model, which is fine, but then they wanted to know why we weren't shut down. So, um, again, that was just an example of how one state was using models, not meant to say that we were going to utilize it. Is there a let's play it by ear model? Uh, there is. It's called the Montego Area School District model. Yeah, because <laughs> as Cherry, as I hear you kind of talking and thinking out loud, I can't help but think we've gone through school years where there's been really bad sickness, where a lot of kids have been out of a classroom. I've had a daughter home with pneumonia. She's home for two weeks and we've been able to keep up. Now I know that it could be different because of the quantity of kids, but I wanna kind of put some confidence in our teachers and give them a chance to educate the students as best as they can, because I think they can do it. Even if they have 19 in their room and three out, and honestly, I'm pleasantly surprised and I think it will help us that these classroom sizes are a lot smaller. So for a lot of them, between 18 and 21, even if you have five out, you have 16 still in your classroom. I guess I, I'm not a fan right now of picking a model and a metric when we have no idea how this is going to go. I kind of like the let's just see how we do and really trust in our staff to, that they're going to do it. The McGuanago way. And Erica, I have to... I have to tell you, I am in agreement with you. These are just some of the questions I've been asked, and so I feel it's my responsibility to ask them. No, no I, those, I think they're good questions. They're I'm very good questions. And we we are getting those questions. And, and we, uh, one of the bigger questions we get is what happens when staff are out? And so we know, yeah. as I said, we have staff that are in quarantine right now. 
and we know that's going to continue after the school year starts. We are trying to figure out a way that a staff member can teach from home when they're quarantined while their class is all at Rowan Hills or at section in third grade. And so obviously we have to have supervision and the Department of Public Instruction has given uh, some, some grace as far as what, you ha uh, what kind of license you have to have. So we can have a substitute teacher in the classroom in third grade while the teacher is home quarantined and then that teacher will instruct from home. It's certainly not the preferred model, but again, it's why we're not establishing metrics at this time because there are so many different possible scenarios out there. And we're just trying to tackle them as they come up. I don't know, did I explain that right, Stephanie? Yes. Other questions? Otherwise, we'll move on to the Waukesha County dashboard. And so I, I do want to give a big shout out to the Waukesha County Health Department and also County Executive Paul Farrell and his office. The county has tr been tremendous the last few weeks. And so they've been great to work with since we started meeting on a weekly basis in early June. Uh, but they really have uh, provided us with a lot of great information in the last few weeks. One of the things that they did is they did upgrade their dashboard. So I encourage all of you, and, and that's the link right here. Well, I, I keep thinking I have a mouse and then I can show you, um, but Ben is pointing right there. That link right there will take you to their upgraded dashboard. It has a lot of good data, including um, the number of cases that are active in our school district, which I'm gonna show you in a few minutes. Uh, but this, this uh, graph I want to talk about briefly. Uh, just again, some basic background. How many people are in Waukesha County? How many people live in the county? About 405,000. And if you recall, we've talked about this before, and it's not shown on this graph, but at the end of the June, when we made a decision to move forward with a face-to-face -face model, model, there were about 22, almost 23 new cases of COVID every day, in, at least the last week of June. And then when we met in July, on July 27, uh, July was a bad month. Uh, we had big increases of COVID in the county throughout the month of July. And so at the end of July, from July 21 to July 27, there were about 113 new cases per day. And I expressed concern at that July 27 meeting uh, because if we had continued with that rate of increase, I don't think we would have opened up on September 1. Uh, now you can see and from this graph and from the graphic on the left-hand side, August 16 to August 22, the last seven days that Waukesha County has data for us, there's been 64 new cases per day. So that, that increase, that dramatic increase that we saw in July has slowed down and so my level of concern has also slowed down. And so right now I'm much more comfortable about trying face-to-face -face instruction than I was on July 27. And one other uh, piece of information, I know people get uncomfortable when we only talk about the number of positives, but Waukesha County does have concern right now about the percent positive. Right now it's 8.8%. So 8.8% is the percent positive. We'd like to see that below 5%, uh, but it hasn't been there for a while. So the last seven days, it's 8.8%. Next, next slide, please, Ben. So this is a graphic that I've also shared with you. And again, I wanna explain why this is a concern so this is the number of positives. This is a cumulative, so a cumulative number. So for the age group, 10 to 19. So that's a big chunk of the students that we serve. That's fifth grade through 12th grade. So in Waukesha County, uh, we are looking at 709 people that have tested positive in that age group. That doesn't mean they're positive right now. Again, that's a cumulative number. The concern that we have is that from March to June 30, there were only 80 in that age group. 
And I understand that was when we were shut down for a big chunk of that. March to June 30, in that age group 10 to 19, only 80 cases. July 1 to August 20, 629. That's a big difference. That's a huge difference. And that should be a concern to all of us when we bring kids back into our buildings. That's why we share that one. I understand the hospitalizations are not great for this age group. I get that. I understand the death rate for this age group. As a matter of fact, in Waukesha County, there has not been any, thank goodness, there have not been any deaths under the age of 40. That's great news. But as I have said repeatedly, we have a lot of students and a lot of staff in our buildings that do have underlying illnesses that will be very negatively impacted by COVID. And they also have people at home that will be negatively impacted by COVID. We have to keep that in mind as we go on. Next slide, Ben. So this is the Waukesha County hospital data. And I, I agree, the hospital data looks very good for Waukesha County. We have plenty of capacity to treat our patients that might need hospitalization, emergency room visits, ICU, respirators. However, as I say right up on the top, this is incomplete. In Waukesha County, Health Department has a disclaimer right down on the bottom. This does not include pro-health. So I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but for whatever reason, pro-health is not sharing their data with Waukesha County Health Department. That's a concern because pro-health has 40% of the hospital footprint in the county. So that data is incomplete, at best incomplete. Next slide. So, and again, a big shout out to Waukesha County Health Department and, and the county, Paul Farrell and his office for this information. They have, and I, and I encourage you to go to this dashboard and explore it and take a look at the data. Uh, but they have broken it down by school district. And this is also good news for us. This also gives me comfort. This also confirms that we are making the right decision to start face-to-face. -face. Right now, in the McGuanago Area School District, uh, ages 5 to 18, we have three active cases. Now, this was of, uh, I want to say, last Thursday or Friday. Uh, we had a couple positives today in the district, so, so I know this changes, but um, three cases or five cases, that, that is not significant. So we, we should be very pleased with that data. Those are active cases, again, within our 90 square miles of the McGuanago Area School District. Any questions on data? All right, so as I said, if we want to have a successful start and we want to sustain that success, we need to be able to have a good COVID testing program in our area. We need to be able to isolate positive cases. We need to have a sound contact tracing program. We need to have a solid quarantine program. We also, and that's the next slide, we need to make sure that we are following our mitigation measures. We will not stay open if we do not follow mitigation measures. It's as simple as that. I'm so over this discussion. If we want to stay open, we have to stay safe. And we have adopted the Waukesha County Stay Safe to Stay Open campaign. And these are the five things that we are going to be focusing on. We need to make sure we understand that staff and students in our building are vulnerable to this virus. 
And not only are they in our building, but they also have people at home. So we need to follow these mitigation measures. We also need to change the culture and I'm as guilty as anyone. We need to stay home if we're sick. Third thing, we need to practice social distancing. As best we can, we need to practice it. And it is tough in schools. A major reason why so many districts are <clears throat> to the hybrid model, because it is a challenge to socially distance. Fourth thing, face coverings. It's mandatory. We have to do it. We have got to wear face masks in schools. It's as simple as that. And then the fifth thing, we have to follow best practice as identified by the CDC and Waukesha County Health Department, washing our hands, et cetera. If we want to stay open face to face, we have to do these things. Any questions? And then at the link at the top there, Ben, if you want to just click on that, I guess it's not at the top right there. These are our face covering protocols. And so there's nothing in there that's surprising. We will be sharing this with students and parents this week. It basically uh, reaffirms, confirms what we have talked about already with the governor's mandate and our requirement that people have to wear masks. Are you specifying what type of face coverings are required? Oh, there it is. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we, we, we did get into the details there, Mary. That's a great question. And, and trust me, we, there is going to be some grace in the beginning. We have some work to do. Um, we, we might have some students or staff with a mask that's not the best one, but we are providing masks for every student, two masks for every student. So we're going to work with parents to make sure this happens. But uh, they have when they come to school uh, next September, uh, next September, next Tuesday on September 1st, masks are required. Okay, and then if we want to go to the next slide, Ben, unless there's a question about masks or mitigation measures, uh, this is the slide that we're talking about the metrics. And so what data are we gonna to use to switch to a hybrid or an all virtual model? This is a work in progress. This is a work in progress. Staffing is my top concern. I'm worried that we're not going to have enough staff. I'm also worried about students not wearing masks. That's not gonna work for us. And then, as I said earlier, we don't have that student absence threshold from Waukesha County yet. Any questions about that? If not, we're going to move into a quick update about fall activities and then I'm done. And I'm sure you'll all be happy about that. So fall athletics and activities, um, the WIA, uh, the Board of Control, did change the fall sports start dates. We talked about this on August 10th. So we do have three sports that have started already. That's cross country, golf, and tennis. Um, they also did create an optional spring season for fall sports. So if things are not working out, as long as we haven't completed half of our competitions, we can move our sports to a special spring season. And in my board memo, I included the dates for that. So, uh, and I, I should have mentioned that soccer and volleyball, boys and girls volleyball and football all start on September 7th. Um, so if, for example, we start volleyball and we get to a point where uh, for a variety of things and for a variety of reasons, we realize that it's not working out, as long as they haven't completed half of their competitions, we could move them if we so wished to the spring season. And then they could compete in the spring with a full schedule. Um, there is one exception to that rule, and that is football. And I want to make sure that everybody understands that, that 
football is being treated a little differently than all of the other fall sports. And what I mean by that is if we do start the football season, if we play one or two games, we play one or two games or even three games, then if we decide that we want to move to the spring, the kids in the spring will have to subtract three games from their seven game schedule. So it is prorated for football only. It's not prorated for the other sports, but it is for football. So if we make the decision halfway through the season in football and they play three games next spring, they would only get to play four. So I do think that makes a difference with our decision-making process. I know there's been a lot of discussion about this, also about the number of spectators to be allowed at our competitions. And the Classic 8 Conference athletic directors and superintendents are meeting on Thursday. So after that meeting on Thursday, I'll have more information for you. And then uh, Parkview Middle School, um, they have three fall sports. They have girls basketball, they have gymnastics, and they have cross country. Right now, we are going to allow them to start cross country. Um, we're going to delay the start of girls basketball until we get more information. And gymnastics, uh, the gymnastics kids work out with our kids club, I believe. And I think that will start a little bit later. But the gymnastics program does have a safety uh, plan in place. And so when they're ready to start, we feel good about allowing them to start. All other activities at the elementary level and uh, throughout the district um, have been put on hold. We want to get the school year started and then we'll reevaluate at that time. Questions about that slide? For athletes that are in a fall sport, who may also be in a spring sport, if their fall sport is moved to spring, they will have to choose between the two, I'm assuming? No, no. So there is, there, there is a special spring season that has been placed in between the winter season. They're ending the winter season a little earlier than usual. And they're starting the traditional spring sports season a little bit later. So they will be able to still participate in winter sports, and spring sports, along with this special fall spring season. There is some overlap, but they would still be able to participate in the sports. How will we be sharing the spectator information after their meeting on Thursday? So, at, um, Andy, Andy Trudell will share that with the uh, different coaches and the coaches will share it with their teams. Uh, we'll get information out to everybody also, I'm assuming in, let's see, so Thursday, um, not quite sure if we'll have it in the key news. We might have to have a special key news on Friday to be able to share that. But I'll, I'll let you, are you asking about the board or are you asking about parents, Eric? I'm sorry. Um, no, I was talking about everybody, parents, because that's the question that I'm getting a lot now. So if it can go out to everybody, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll get it out to everybody on Thursday. Um, that might be a little ambitious, definitely on Friday. Any other questions? All right, great, thanks everybody. We can move on, Erica, to the next uh, item on the agenda. So I have finance and facilities update. All right, yeah. So I'll provide a tax levy and budget update here for everybody. Um, regarding next year's tax levy, when we went to our annual meeting back in um, August, we uh, earlier, I should say, here in the summer in July, we had uh, projected 19. $7 million in equalization aid. So that was based upon an assumption where 
we are going to get a budget repair bill from state government. At this time, we know that's not going to be the case. Uh, we might see a correction later on after the elections, but based on what I know right now and using the same methodologies that we use in the past to, to guess what equalization aid might be, right now I, I am projecting that number to be $22.9 million. A significant increase from the 19.7. So when that equalization aid goes up, the tax levy will go down. So that is positive news, that's good news. Um, I gave a memo there that summarizes that right now. I also got more information here on an update as to what our equalization aid, or excuse me, our equalized property value will be as of January 1st of this year. We'll get that information in late September or early October. We were projecting that our property values would increase by 3%, but right now it's looking that they'll be just north of 6%. So that's double as to what we thought. And when that property value goes up district-wide, that means there's more hands on deck to help pay the, uh, the ultimate property tax bill that comes from the K-12 school district. So the mill rate, um, the mill rate with the property values going up is going to decrease quite a bit. Um, right now, if we tax at the absolute minimum, our, our mill rate would be $7.34. The electors of the district, when we had our annual meeting, approved a, a budget and tax levy that allowed for a mill rate of $7.99, so just under $8 per $1,000 of a home's value would be the tax rate. And that, again, all things being constant, would be lowest in the county. With that being said, if the district were to uh, focus on a $7.99 mill rate, the, the school board in come October when the final tax levy is levied could add on to the, the, law, the referendum debt uh, tax levy for the project that was done at McGuango High School in April 2016. The, the basic levy needs to be $3.3 million to stay current. We're entering the fifth year of, uh, of a 20 year repayment there. But the district would have the opportunity to levy uh, an additional um, two point almost six million dollars on top of the three point three million dollars. What that would do is ultimately we'd begin to prepaying future debt early. So just like somebody might have a thirty year mortgage on their house, if you if you make additional payments along the way, you'll settle it earlier than the thirty years calls for. And this is no different here. So if the if the board were to over levy uh, beyond the basic three point three million that's required. Um, we could do that and still keep the mill rate the lowest in the county. So I'm happy to report that right there. And, and I wanted to bring that to your attention. We'll look to finalize this in October, but I don't want to bring it to the board in October. Um, I'm going to keep it current here by bringing it up here in August and I'll, and I'll bring it up again as a reminder come September when we do another tax levy and budget update. But the increased equalization aid is good news for the current school year so is the increased property value. So that's a bit of good news here as we talk about all these things here tonight. So any questions that I can answer for uh, board members on that? Okay. So regarding the budget, I wanna provide a little bit of information on that here. The budget, and, and as, we, as you look at what were uh, the hires and the retirements that are, are, are in tonight's agenda, there's a lot of late movement, something that we've never seen this late into a school summer. So people are, we have a lot of turnover, a lot of moving parts. That has made it difficult to lock the budget down. I like to, by this time, I like to be speaking in definitive terms as to where the budget stands but we're not there yet. The virtual enrollments as, as they moved up and down, or I should say as they moved up and up, has caused for us to have to um, make adjustments with our virtual staffing model, as well as finding other people to teach the, um, the special areas at the elementary and the, high, uh, and the secondary level. Right now we have $2.1 million invested in the, in the salary and benefits of the, of the personnel who are teaching our virtual classes. So that has really just turned on a dime here in the last 60 days. I know we still have a hire that we have to make for our uh, grades 10 through 12 math. And there might be a couple other uh, outstanding pieces to that virtual staffing, but 
that that's a that's a significant piece of the budget. We've also obviously had a lot of costs. I shared it uh, in July about costs we were uh, assuming at the time, but as those costs have materialized, the federal government has given us a hundred thousand dollars to mitigate the spread of COVID. So that'll buy you a few things like hand sanitizer pumps and um, in installing, uh, I should say, replacing bubblers that we, we don't want kids to use this year. We're gonna replace those with uh, water bottle filling stations. But there's a lot of other costs that go way beyond that. The technology and the, plat the, the webcams we mentioned earlier and the technology platforms, it's not just uh, hand sanitizer and cleaning products, it's how do we deliver education for the kids that are in a virtual environment and those kids that may be quarantined over the course of the school year. Because it's one thing to reopen and then once we reopen, uh, the name of the game is to stay open. So we're gonna take all those, take the money that we have and, and to do the best we can with those things. Right now, as I look at the 2021 budget, we aren't gonna be balanced and that's okay. As we finalize our audit this past year, we had $2.1 million in fund balance that we were able to add from 1920 in anticipation of increased costs here for 2021. So we will, again, we won't be balanced. I will have a much more uh, clear and definitive budget come September that we'll talk about. And then we'll look to finalize that at the end of October, at the last meeting in October. So I feel good about things. There's no uh, uh, alarms that I want to sound right now, but things, this is not business as usual. Things are different right now, but I have no major concerns. Are there any questions I can answer as far as that goes? Did I bore all you guys? <laughs> I can't figure it out. I wanted to hear more about tertiary, but uh, yeah. we can say that for another time. I was time. waiting for that part too, thank you. Yeah. There are people on here that don't know about tertiary amounts. <laughs> okay. Are you done? Would you like me to be done, Art? Yes. Okay, <laughs> done. I do wanna also say, just mention real briefly here, we're working to refinance our long-term debt. So I had given everybody a, a document that looks like this in the packet. This is our 20 year repayment uh, of what's remaining of it. We're gonna look to refinance that. We have historic lows in, in interest rates. So for our remaining payments that we have to make, we're gonna refinance those and we hope to save somewhere between 900 and $1 million when we do that. Wow. Next month, I'll ask the board, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a resolution for you to pass that passes the authority to me to refinance uh, when I, when I, the people we work with at uh, Robert W. Baird, when they notify me, hey, we think this is the right time to refinance. We think today is the day where interest rates are lowest. Um, rather than call a board meeting at random on a Wednesday, I'll, I'll be asking for you guys to give me the authority to refinance if we hit certain parameters that you'll agree to. We'll look to pass that in September and then maybe sh refinance shortly thereafter. But that's good news for the community. Yeah. All right, that's all I have on that. So then uh, the second thing that I'd like to just bring up is just give a quick busing update and transportation update here. So we've done a lot of work here since we've last met uh, as far as busing goes. We identified the, of the 5,000 kids that we have in our district, fourth, approximately 4,000 um, are eligible for transportation. Uh, to be eligible for transportation, you gotta, live within, uh, you gotta live two miles or further away from your home school. Unless, and the caveat is unless there's a, a hazard along the way. So if there's a county highway, uh, I-43, a federal highway, railroad tracks, um, those, uh, those hazards along the way will say, okay, even though uh, a student lives within two miles, they will get transportation. Of those 4,000 kids, when we uh, removed the students who chose virtual schooling, we had about 3,500 kids that we anticipated getting on the bus. So we sent out surveys to all 3,500 kids, uh, to their parents rather, asked them to opt in or opt out based on how transportation was gonna look so we could better create seating charts 
And we also encourage families to consider a, an alternative means of transportation to and from school based on the fact that we simply can't social distance on a bus. So right now the drivers at Dousman Transport have the final list of students as to who opted in and out. Any student who did not have a survey completed, we assumed they were going to get on the bus. We understand that some email is at an all time high in everybody's life right now. When we sent this out, we know that some parents may miss that. So we, we just assumed that those students would still get on the bus. So the drivers at Dowson are currently working right now to design seating charts um, to our uh, directions and our specifications. And we'll be communicating those out throughout uh, Wednesday of this week. Uh, we'll post them at open house on Thursday so that families can see where their seat will be on the bus. We also created on our website, we, we made a, a form, parents who initially opt out of transportation, <laughs> they decide that they like to carpool or they like to take their own kids. Um, when, if something changes, they can opt back in simply by filling out the form. We ask for three days lead time, so, simply so we can create a new seating chart and potentially reroute if, if it, uh, that particular student re requires rerouting. So we just need a little bit of lead time, but then we can add students in over the course of the year if need be. So that's the work we're doing before the school year begins. And once the school year goes down, September will be that time of year where we have a lot of transportation concerns from parents. So I've also created another form on our transportation website where parents, if they have a concern about the distance or location to their, uh, of their bus stop, or any other type of concern that as it relates to transportation. Uh, we're asking parents to, and we'll communicate to, that to them this week, um, where to go and uh, enter their concerns, that those concerns will be sent directly to me and to the management team at Dousman, and we'll begin to review those by Friday, September 18th. So in a typical year, we know there's gonna be 20 to 30 parents who are interested in making modifications or <coughs> Changes. <laughs> this year, I, I'm not really sure what to think, but uh, onward and upward, we'll, we'll, we'll get it done here. That's all Thanks, I have the transportation update. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Tom. You. A lot of work. Thanks, Tom. All right, so we'll move into action items. We have appointments, resignations, and retirements. It's a long list. You've been busy. <laughs> um, yeah, principals as well. Um, so in terms of retirement, we um, opened up a window for individuals that wanted to consider retiring. And so we have five retirements for you. Um, Joseph Kashalik, who's a science teacher at the high school, he has 29 years with the district. Pig Meadow, an English teacher at McGuanico High School, she has 20 years with the district. Scott Pratt, a math computer science teacher, 29 years at the high school. Um, Tom Schibert, a speech language pathologist, um, 30 years with the district. And Tom Worth, a physical education teacher at Parkview Middle School, 24 years of um, service. So we certainly thank them for um, their service to the district. In terms of resignation, we have um, three resignations. All of these resignations um, in some part are related um, to the pandemic. Um, Chad Allen is a FIAD teacher um, at Rolling Hills Elementary School. Um, Catherine Laura Hudson, an English teacher at Parkview Middle School. And Audra Stanislavski, a special ed teacher at Clarendon Elementary School. So we certainly thank them and wish them well in their future. The appointments, um, these are the individuals that we have hired um, since the last board meeting and mainly in the last three weeks. Um, so it's been kind of a whirlwind as soon as we established how many kids we were going, students we were going to have in, in classes, then we were able to place people um, teachers into the virtual positions, which then vacated a lot of positions that we had to create. 
So I've broken it up by school and then alphabetically within the school. So I'm just gonna whip through it as fast as possible. Um, Big Bend Elementary, we welcome Jody Dudenko, sixth grade teacher, limited term. Robin Martin, a first grade teacher, limited term. Nathaniel Morin, third grade teacher. And Jennifer Wallerman, who's a Title I teacher. At Clarendon Elementary School, we welcome Margaret Cleary, third grade teacher, Lynn Marie Hackbarth, second grade teacher, Alexandra Schneider, fifth grade teacher, Jessica Zakalis, sixth grade teacher, Amanda Turcha, Title I teacher, and Laura Wood, guidance counselor. At Prairie View Elementary School, we welcome Kevin Council, physical education teacher, Rebecca Taddy, library technology specialist, Rolling Hills Elementary School, Tanner Johnson, physical education teacher, Alexandra Koenig, library technology specialist, and Sarah Schmidt, Title I teacher. At Parkview Middle School, Megan Gulak, English teacher, William Krieger, English teacher, Emma Linsky, social studies teacher, Caitlin Moore, math teacher, Jennifer Prowitz, science teacher, and McGuanago High School, Shanti Hendrickson, English teacher, Megan Mueller, Spanish teacher. She split between McGuanago High School and Parkview Middle School. Daniel Pollock, science teacher, and Scott Saharsky, math teacher. And then we have two um, positions that are more district-wide centered. Trisha Heller, school district nurse, and Jean Murphy, an English language learner teacher. I'd like to make the motion to approve those. I'll second. So we have a motion and a second. Any other questions, discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No motion carries. All right, support staff wages. All right, so this is essentially this, uh, it, the same style of support staff wage increase that was proposed back in March. So just to remind the board here of what's in, what's in this right now is that there's a, um, first off, we're gonna increase the wage scale here. I, I provided this document that has some yellow in it. And we are looking to increase the minimum rates of pay and the starting rates of pay across all support class, uh, support staff classifications. Uh, all are gonna move up by at least $1 with instructional assistance and our people that are, have academic-based jobs moving up by $1.50. Um, the budget will create uh, uh, enough raises for our returning employees where that they will get at least a 2% increase or will they look back methodology where if they were to get the starting raises, um, back when they started along with 1.25% increases thereafter, we will give them the greatest of the two, assuming that their performance is, is up to standard and, and the raise is warranted. We created a couple new classifications. We distinguished our, at the, with our health aides. We have health aides that uh, work throughout each of our buildings. Um, we distinguish the health aid at the 912 level, just like we do with our building managers because it's just a different animal when you have 1,600 kids and that many staff members there. We also created for under instructional assistance, we have uh, transportation assistance and homebound assistance that we wanted to recognize formally because it's becoming a, a common practice to have those employees on your workforce here. We also are increasing, we have a, a substitute rate of pay that you can see at the bottom of that exhibit. And when we have substitute workers that are essentially folks on call, we, we call them to come fill in a shift here or there, be it in food service or as a custodian, we are gonna set those rates of pay equal to what starting an employee would have. In the past, those subs would get much lower rates of pay. Um, but we're desperate for the help and we gotta make an adjustment here. So the overall total cost of the proposal is, is a $315,000 investment. Uh, that I think is a very worthy investment for our support staff. I don't think this accomplishes everything, but it's definitely a step in the right direction. So I, I recommend this to the board. In terms of funding it, 
historically, we've levied $1.1 million into Fund 41. Uh, about 800,000 of that is spent in the year that's levied with about $300,000 that's set aside. We have too many current needs right now to put money away for uh, our buildings down the road. I'd like to go back to doing that. I think at some point we can manage to do both and stay balanced, but at this time, we gotta choose one or the other. And right now I'm gonna recommend that we invest it in our support staff personnel. Can we make a motion? We approve. I think we have a motion from Cherry and a second from Jim. Any other questions or discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thanks everybody. Sean, so, do you have any unfinished business? Uh, just if I could have Susan and Tom just give a quick update on our current vacancies. So Susan, how many teacher vacancies do we have left? Ballpark it. Yep, we have eight, um, eight openings left. That includes two Title I positions and six um, regular teaching positions. Thanks, Susan. And then Tom? How's the support staff vacancy rate right now? Uh, we have 39 vacancies that we've, we've done hiring, but as soon as we hire, we lose some others. We're, we're really just holding serve, but not being ground, so to speak here. So with the action that was just taken, I hope that we begin to start to improve that over the next, um, you know, very near term future here, the next couple of weeks. We still have about a 14% vacancy rate, and we have 40 open positions right now, just under. I hate to be the one that have to ask this, but if we do not fill those positions, Susan, how can we start school? Um, we are working as fast as we can to get these filled. Um, I'm confident that we'll be able to fill um, most of them or restructure them. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, for example, um, the chemistry, we might have to restructure um, just the way we um, offer learning. And Stephanie, maybe you can comment a little more. Most, most of these positions, in fact, um, all of the positions except for one are at the high school. Okay, thank you. That's all I have, Erica. Okay, no legislation and correspondence? Nope. Any other board member questions? We're very quiet tonight. So I think we need a motion to head into executive session. I would like to make the motion we go into executive session. I'll second it. And we have a motion and a second. Cherry, would you mind roll calling us out? No, I wrote you guys down so I didn't forget anybody. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Mary D. Amore. Yes. Joel Frederick. Yep. Jill Warner. Yes. Erica Connor. Yes. Jeff Vocal. Yes. Craig Bird. Yep. Andy Menke. Okay, Andy just texted me. He said yes, he can't be unmuted. Okay. Art Schneider. Yes. And me, yes. All right, thank you everyone for tuning in. Okay, just a quick reminder to board members that um, we will exit this meeting and then you will enter executive session with the special Zoom meeting invite. So I'll see you in a couple minutes and I don't anticipate the executive session taking long. Right, Tom? Right, yep, it'll go quick. Okay, all right. Great. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.